why did the vote um, matter so much? Well, last year we passed a, uh, a successor bill to AB 32 that set more aggressive overall climate targets, 40% reductions by 2030, but explicitly SB 32 did not speak to whether uh, cap and trade should be one of the mechanisms for achieving this uh, overall carbon reduction goal. Uh, and this was, there was some politics behind that. We'll talk about sort of the perceptions of how cap and trade has been working in a second. Um, but just in terms of procedural um, comments, the renewal of cap and trade, unlike SB 32, uh, it was broadly thought that it would require a two thirds vote in California. This has to do with the um, history of California and legal requirements for passing taxes. Uh, going back to Proposition 13, over the years, we, uh, we keep redefining what it is that requires a two-thirds vote. And uh, there was a ballot measure that happened during the 2000s, uh, 2010s, that seems to have ratcheted up the legal requirements for a cap and trade program relative to what those requirements were under AB 32. Uh, so, while there was still some debate going on, I think most observers felt that a two-thirds vote was uh, necessary to at least put it on a pretty solid legal footing, and that's why it was deemed as so important. All right, so um, it was difficult to get a two-thirds vote, in part because um, the natural uh, hesitation from people who are worried about the economic consequences of, of climate regulation, but also uh, from across the spectrum, there have been some criticisms of the cap and trade market. Um, I want to emphasize these are not my criticisms. This is sort of my attempt to capture the uh, tone of the discussion that's been playing out over the last year plus. Um, one of the big uh, sort of ironic uh, criticisms about the cap and trade market is that prices have been too low, that there's not been enough revenue generated from selling allowances. The reason I say that's ironic is uh, basically that's saying that there's just not enough carbon emissions out there to sell the allowances. Uh, and in a sense, from uh, a, a pure cap and trade perspective, it means that we've been reaching our targets at really lower than expected costs. Uh, but one consequence of that is that there haven't been as many allowances being sold. Um, if we have time, we can talk about the fact that government revenues in California have been even more volatile than the auction revenues. Um, and that has to do with the role of allocation mechanics, essentially the direct allocations of allowances to uh, industrial entities, utilities, trade exposed entities, and so forth. Those allocations take priority over the California auction revenues. Uh, and so when there's a shortfall of need for allowances, uh, essentially the California revenue share is last in line for issuing those allowances. And that has made California's auction revenues even more volatile than, um, than the general allowance market. Um, just to give uh, a sense of how this is fed back into the political discourse, uh, articles like this were not unusual over the last two years where uh, we've had a couple auctions where very few allowances were sold and uh, basically none of the allowances that would have gone to the state were sold. Uh, I mean, this created a sense that the market was not reliable, uh, that um, there was something that was creating a, um, a need for more stable revenue, as this quote from Senate President uh, Kevin DeLeon uh, indicates. So the other criticisms that have uh, floated around had to do with uh, not enough reductions happening in disadvantaged communities. And here's where, uh, as Brian mentioned, there were two bills, we'll get to that. Uh, there was a uh, sometimes a conflation, sometimes a, a sort of combination of concerns over local pollutants. Uh, AB 32, SB 32 does not explicitly address local pollutants. It's a climate change bill. Um, there is language that says we need to consider the impacts on local pollutants. Um, but there was a, a very long drawn out discussion about the implications of cap and trade and of climate regulation writ large on um, the correlation of local pollutants. Um, and certainly a, a large and influential group of environmental justice uh, advocates have played uh, an important role in the discussions about trying to advance their concerns on local pollutants, and uh, many of them were strong critics of cap and trade. Um, 
part of that local pollution concern fed into the perception that there was too much reliance on offsets. Um, I think that's open for debate about how much we've really relied on offsets to, dip, to, to date, um, but certainly that has been adjusted in the new bill. Um, and there's also been some issues having to do with how we treat uh, uh, the regulation of emissions outside our borders for products, primarily electricity and gasoline that are brought in, uh, but also a more general um, set of concerns about how we deal with the leakage question. Uh, so uh, that's sort of the backdrop. The, we needed a two-thirds vote, um, and there was a combination of concerns um, on the business side about the potential uh, costs of a tighter, more strict standard, and on the um, environmental advocacy side about uh, environmental integrity and about local pollution. So the way that these um, a consensus was, or at least the two-thirds majority was constructed, was by uh, devising these two bills, one that addresses specifically local pollution and the other, AB 398, that we will be discussing that addresses cap and trade. Um, a lot of us who have been involved view this as a really uh, positive uh, direction that uh, dealing with local pollution is best done through regulations that address local pollutants uh, and much less effectively done through regulation that addresses greenhouse gases. So this sort of pairing of two separate uh, regulatory initiatives was a really a positive development. Both bills passed yesterday, uh, as Brian said, we got a super majority, and so uh, I don't, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't say exactly how this fits, but the general consensus is that it puts it on much more solid legal footing going forward now. All right, so to get to the 398 itself, and, and what I'm going to do is just highlight some aspects of the market design. There certainly was a lot of wrangling and negotiations over what to do with uh, the revenues generated from the cap and trade market. We're not going to focus on that too much in this discussion. Um, the, the real key element here uh, is that it extends cap and trade. Uh, and really, relative to the types of proposals that have been brought up over the last uh, six months to a year, it's quite remarkable how much of the existing program has been uh, retained. Uh, and so, although there are some important changes, the, the general structure of the cap and trade program remains uh, largely as it has been uh, since 2013. So, uh, importantly, we've renewed it now to 2030, and uh, allowances that have been in, uh, in circulation today and will be sold from now through 2020 will be fungible into the post-2021 period. Uh, there were some proposals that would not have allowed that. Um, one important change relative to the current program is that it establishes a so-called hard price ceiling. Uh, this is a departure from the existing approach for containing allowance prices on the high side. The existing approach uses something called a allowance price containment reserve. Uh, this was this uh, cache of 120 million tons of allowances or so that would have been made available only at prices that uh, are we could call a price ceiling, but it was a containment uh, price. Uh, some people, myself included, have raised this concerns over the years about what would happen if this containment reserve were exhausted um, and there was some concern over the potential just uncertainty about what would happen under those circumstances. In principle, there would be no further uh, mechanism to contain allowance prices if that were to happen. Um, now, the uh, plan would be to have a mechanism that would essentially sell more allowances and, and make sure that whatever the price ceiling ends up at um, is a firm price ceiling. There wouldn't be the ambiguity of, of what would happen if there's a finite number of allowances made available at this price ceiling. What would happen if that finite number were exhausted? So this is a departure from the APCR approach. Um, this picture is from a report I've done with uh, Frank Wallach and Severin Borenstein looking at extension of the program through 2030. Uh, just to give an illustration of how the cap levels, the red line here, um, line up relative to um, the, the black line is a business as usual emissions forecast and the ranges, which are quite broad, are illustrated by the dashed lines to the right. This is uh, a forecast methodology that we've been using for a while now, trying to forecast out business as usual emissions. Um, and what you can see is 
we are, uh, although the cap was intentionally set a uh, relatively loose beginning uh, in 2013, 2015, it is ratcheting down quite rapidly. Um, and somewhere around 2019, 2020, will cross business as usual projections um, and then rapidly decline below business as usual. So although there's a perception that the cap hasn't done uh, as much as some might have expected, it's important to remember that that was in part by design, that the cap was started out as a rather um, loose mechanism and has been uh, ratcheting down over time. And again, what matters is the overall budget um, now over 18 years of a program, not necessarily the annual caps. All right, so we've got a hard price ceiling. Um, it's not, uh, the level of the hard price ceiling was not set in legislation. I think a lot of us view that as a, as a helpful development um, that has been uh, kicked over to the Air Resources Board uh, and other regulatory bodies who will now consider the level to set the price ceiling at. Um, perhaps we can prognosticate on what that might look like. The ARB has their own proposal out there. Um, but right now, there's still, this is uh, to be determined. And presumably, this would be done in coordination with the other WCI members. Certainly, um, those people working with Canada and California have argued that that's um, that that's a necessary element of this. Uh, importantly, offsets have also been restricted. The original program allowed offsets uh, up to 8% of any individual uh, compliance obligation. Uh, that was limited to 4% through 2025. It ratchets up to 6% after. Um, this is done on a compliance entity by compliance entity basis. So this also overstates really the uh, the amount of offsets that are likely to be used. It's not simply take this percentage and multiply by the total cap level um, because some smaller entities are unlikely to bother using offsets. Um, it will probably end up at a somewhat lower number, perhaps a largely lower number. Uh, we'll talk about there are some um, elements prioritizing local offsets. Uh, some explicit targets for local offsets. Um, the, there are some, I think, remaining questions about how these types of requirements interact with uh, the Commerce Clause and other, uh, other legal areas um, that hopefully we'll get a chance to discuss. But there certainly is um, a signaling and there are gonna be some committees formed that will try to identify the types of offsets that could be generated and utilized within California. Uh, and then lastly, this uh, APCR, the, uh, the number of allowances that have been used as a price ceiling enforcement mechanism uh, prior to 2020, uh, because there's going to be a hard price ceiling, which in essence creates sort of an unlimited APCR, uh, the finite existing APCR um, there's been negotiations over what to do with it. Uh, and it's at least some of it is going to be dedicated to intermediate price steps, uh, referred to as speed bumps, which are levels that are gonna be in between the price floor and the price ceiling. Uh, there is some ambiguity in my reading of the language about exactly how many uh, go into each of these steps, but it is going to be um, I think somewhere around the, the range of 50 million tons in each of these steps. Um, that's smaller than some of the original proposals for price uh, for speed bumps, um, but it, it will have some effect um, less than some of the earlier uh, proposals might have, have indicated. Uh, it's worth reminding everyone that cap and trade is not the only uh, even the primary mechanism in California for dealing with uh, climate uh, greenhouse gases. Um, this is a, a picture taken from the Air Resources Board's 2030 scoping plan. Um, I'm not necessarily endorsing these numbers, but it gives a relative qualitative sense. Uh, cap and trade is the blue uh, thatched area at the top. Uh, there's a lot of other directed measures, including renewable portfolio standards, energy efficiency standards, um, low carbon fuel standards, and so forth, that are uh, designed to uh, achieve carbon reductions outside of and really independent of the uh, cap and trade price. Um, and to the extent these are effective, uh, 
then it, that puts downward pressure on the allowance price. It means the cap is unnecessary. To the extent they're less effective, it puts more pressure on the cap to sort of fill in the shortfall that other directed measures might have left. Uh, so what are the implications overall? Um, well, there are a lot of important details uh, that remain to be resolved, particularly uh, the levels and specifics of these uh, both speed bumps and the price ceilings, um, the changes to the offset protocols, um, what, uh, what this local offset uh, prioritization looks like. These are things that will be sorted out through regulatory processes now. Um, overall, though, I think it's, it's worth uh, noting most people uh, seem to uh, agree that the next phase is a much more challenging uh, and um, uh, ambitious target than the current phase. Uh, and so while allowance prices have been at the floor, and there seems to almost be a presumption in some circles that they'll just stay at the floor, um, when uh, we did our projections, uh, we found a much higher probability that by 2030, the demand for allowances would exceed the supply of allowances without much more aggressive abatement, um, a 40% probability of being at the floor compared to a 90% probability of being at the floor during the earlier period. So although there's still a, you know, a decent chance that prices will settle at the floor, meaning that the allowance supply will be roughly equal to the allowance demand, there's much higher probabilities that allowances um, will uh, be in higher demand than that, uh, will end up at the ceiling or at some intermediate point. Um, if you want to see some more details of that, there's a link here to, uh, to our report that did those forecasts. So I'll end it there and kick it over to further discussion. Thanks very much, Jim. That's great. Um, now we're going to turn to Dave Sawyer, and Dave's an environmental economist with EnviroEconomics. He's a recognized leader in the economics of climate policy and energy transition in Canada. And Dave is going to talk a little bit about uh, here about what his about his thoughts for what the ramifications are for the operation of the Canadian carbon market. Dave. There, so you can hear me, thumbs up for hearing. Thumbs up, okay. Uh, hello folks, thanks for having me on the webinar. Thanks for putting this together and clearly these stars aligned perfectly for, for the webinar. So uh, really interesting uh, to, to, to be you know thinking about this live. Um, I've only got about four or five slides. So I've been doing with a whole group of folks, um, a lot of analytics around regulatory impact analysis of various proposals in Canada, including Ontario's cap and trade program. Um, and then also doing some deep decarbonization work uh, as part of the deep decarbonization pathways work out of, out of France. And so it's given a kind of an interesting view of sort of where are we from a regulatory perspective now? Where are we going to the NDC, Canada's NDC in 2030? And then what does deep, deeper decarbonization look like beyond? So I'm gonna mix a bit of all that in here, but try and focus on the, you know, on, on, on AB 398 and what it means for Canada. Um, so the first, the, the, the presentation, I'm gonna do about five, eight minutes, so I won't take too long. The case for linking, we've got a long history for looking at the case for linking in Canada. I'll show some pictures to that effect. Um, carbon bridges to somewhere. So what does this AB 398 mean for Ontario and Quebec, given that we're moving to linkage and have linkage? Uh, and we now really have sort of this, you know, this nice North Star out into the future to start, you know, really sort of fixing expectations around the programs. And then, and then one quick slide in Canada's progress to our, to our NDC and deep decarbonization beyond. So to put all this sort of Canadian uh, abatement effort in perspective against a deeper decarbonization trajectory. So the long history. So, you know, we've been tumbling models and numbers for a long time, looking at sort of leading lag, lagging or harmonizing with the US. Um, the graphic here is some work that we did for the National Roundtable, a bunch of folks did uh, in 2011. And we basically ran, you know, some economy-wide simulations, different carbon prices, and we said, okay, what, you know, what matters between the two countries on leading, you know, should we lead, lag, or harmonize? And you know, no matter no matter how we look at this, and, and more recent modeling and older modeling, we always found sort of a common outcome, which was abatement in Canada was a lot more expensive, so cost containment really mattered. So aligning on quantity targets with the U.S. really never made sense because our abatement costs were quite high, relatively, as the, as the graph would show. And in fact, if you look at Canada's NDC, we ended up in a place where we're not we're, we're not 
following the US on their NDC number, we're actually setting a, a different NDC number, which I think reflects a little better sort of the structural differences in the economies. And the two and the structural dif differences really boil down to sort of large oil and gas uh, emissions that are hard to control in our national inventory, really decarbonized electricity sitting at 80% uh, decarbonized electricity now, climbing much larger with current policy, maybe 85, 87% by 2030 and then versus coal electricity in the US. Vehicle fleets and housing stocks fairly similar, so high cost abatement, but really it's those two dynamics that drove some outcomes. How, how much does it matter? So we've done some recent modeling, the last bullets here, uh, you know, even with efficient national carbon pricing that we're moving towards, you know, unless we have significant cost containment in the bottom slide here, or the bottom bullet, about 80 megatons of WCI uh, imports, that's a maximum, I'll talk about that in a second. But when you start shaving off that level of, of sort of imports to true up to a, a target, we get our price falling from $220 a ton, even with an aggressive regulatory package in place, down to about $150 a ton. And you know, no matter how much we sort of interrogate and beat up our models, we come to very similar, similar conclusions. So that the cost containment really helps nationally. Um, in Ontario, this is a chart from the regulatory work we did for the Ontario government on the cap and trade system. Really simple here. This is the same program linked and unlinked. So we've got a hard cap at 20 bucks or hard price cap at 20 bucks, which is sort of the WCI price forecast in 2020. We tumble the numbers with proceeds recycling to technology investments. And we sort of get not a lot of leakage, emission leakage. We get not a lot of emission reductions in Ontario and we get a, a, the need for a significant backstop of, of, of emission reductions. And those can come from WCI imports, pan-Canadian offsets, so the offset system is being developed now in Ontario, it's operating in Quebec, but they're expanding the protocols to accept pan-Canadian offsets, or these could be action plan reductions from proceeds recycling, both Quebec and Ontario have quite an aggressive complementary uh, regulatory and, and proceeds recycling package. But for simplicity, we said, okay, let's just use WCI imports. And the big difference here is clearly the carbon price, 160 bucks versus $20 Canadian linked and unlinked, which basically just says, you know, the targets in 2030 for Ontario, very, very deep, very expensive given the structure of the economy. So linking really sort of matters to Ontario and this sort of thinking helped push within the government of Ontario, push forward the leaking agenda, linking agenda. A um, couple more slides. So what does AB 398 mean for Canada? This is pure conjecture, right? You got to be a little fearless to start saying stuff like this. But you know, I mean, we're, you know, it's sort of informed somewhat. So there's four or five areas that I think AB uh, 398 impacts uh, Canada somewhat. I mean, the first really is on this price ceiling and the tiered speed, speed bumps. So you, you know, there's concern, there's two concerns that were talked about earlier. One, that the price follows the floor and one that it takes off to the ceiling really quick as that 2030 California target bites. And it looks like the price ceiling and the tiered, tiered speed bumps mute that price impact. When the, you know, AB, uh, AB 398 talks about the social cost of carbon, well that can, you can think of that as maybe a price ceiling. And when you start thinking about that as a price ceiling, you're thinking about prices probably under 100 Canadian, you know, sort of 75 US maybe more like 80 Canadian, you know, 65, 68 US. Um, and so, you know, that the probability of moving from the floor to the ceiling, as was just talked about, starts to weigh to price kind of in an interesting way. So all that to say, we have probably prices rising more than previous forecasts, but they're not taking off as much as we were probably concerned about climbing to the ceiling over a hundred bucks really quick. So the price ceiling and the tiered speed bumps add more abatement in Canada and I think a little more certainty. And I think it really helps clean, you know, the perception that it's cleaning up the allocations helps the political economy in Canada, that it's not over allocated, that prices are rising, that, you know, the market's going short ultimately uh, at some time in the future. The offsets is interesting, you know, obviously puts upward pressure on the carbon price. The implications for offset supply in and out of Canada and around Canada is something I think we have to watch. My quick take is, yeah, we'll probably have more offset supply out of Canada as maybe the California system doesn't, you know, there's not as much in the secondary market there to play with. But I, you know, I could be wrong. I think that's an open question we sort of need to figure out. But certainly the higher carbon price forecast will place more offsets in, in supply in Canada um, in, in the longer term. Um, the free allocations are kind of interesting. Um, you know, the political economy with the large final emitters in Canada is, you know, one of competitiveness, really, really concerned about cross-border trade with the U.S. 
and to the extent that free allocations are approved in California, it sort of takes the pressure off uh, governments in Canada to move away from the free allocations in the short term and makes, I think, the policy more durable. Um, proceeds not relevant at all for Canada. Each jurisdiction is doing its own thing, and the federal government really doesn't have a view on proceeds recycling under its federal price floor. Um, and finally, the federal, federal price floor. I mean, one of the problems has been with this federal, um, the federal price backstop. One, you've got sort of a price trajectory for the taxing jurisdictions, and the other is you have an exemption from that price trajectory if your cap decline is aligned with Canada's NDC. So you've got, you can have sort of provinces coexisting with two different carbon prices um, in Canada and both being in conformance with the federal backstop price. Now you have misaligned carbon costs there, low WCI, higher price floor, climbing to 50 bucks under the federal system Canadian. So that's caused some political economy pressures and any movement to bring those two together as we see with the tightening of uh, AB 398 um, will I think reduce some of the pressure, especially if we see prices starting to climb after 2023, 2024, as some of the sort of recent price forecasts are indicating. Um, so yeah, conjecture. And then, so here's the NDC in Canada. So this is some deep decarbonization work we did. The top line is sort of where emissions are and where they need to go. There's some different transitions here. The red dots, Canada's NDC. There's a 2.5, uh, 2 degrees C, 1.5 degrees C uh, price trajectory. This is sort of where emissions are. We think they've peaked in Canada, given the policies that have been rolled out. Um, about a year ago, we had a gap of about 170 megatons, which was quite a large gap, and we thought it was insurmountable. Um, along came the federal government. They've imposed a price floor, which will pick up the laggards. We get about another 18 to 20 megatons coming off this national price floor that fills holes, um, doesn't preempt a lot of the existing programs, Ontario, Quebec, uh, British Columbia, Alberta. Um, here's the WCI true up in Quebec and Ontario. So this is the difference between domestic abatement at the carbon prices in Ontario and Quebec um, through the WCI versus their targets and their abatement potential. And it's a big true up. So you're going to need offsets, you're going to need WCI imports, and you're going to need complementary policy, it looks like, and, and proceeds recycling. And finally, here's the Pan-Canadian framework, which has a low carbon fuel standard and has a bunch of other sort of complementary policies, climate finance, innovation, R&D. We didn't model it all, but roughly this is where we are. So Canada, you know, looks pretty well positioned to sort of bend the emissions down into the future. So I will stop there and say thank you. Well, thank you, Dave. That was terrific. I mean, clearly the extension of the cap and trade program in California has important implications for Canada. Um, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn the microphone to Dallas Bertrand. Dallas, uh, many of you know, uh, is a distinguished fellow at Resources for the Future. Uh, it's a Washington-based um, independent uh, nonpartisan research institution. Uh, Dallas has also worked extensively on greenhouse gas cap and trade systems in California the Northeastern Reggie states in the United States and elsewhere. He really is one of the world's top experts on this. So Dallas, you know, uh, which of the changes in the California program strikes you as the most important, the most challenging, the most promising, sort of you have free reign to weigh in on everything we've heard up to now. Thanks, Brian. I hope everyone can hear me. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Good. Um, well, thanks everybody for uh, inviting me to be on. I want to take a step back. These were two excellent presentations and really accurate as far as I know the situation. So I want to take a step back and, and just mention some context about the importance of what happened in California. That has as much to do with the way that it happened as anything else and the implications for Canada, the US and internationally. First of all, to really notice that it was a bipartisan outcome that was achieved in California. Uh, the the uh, leader of the Republicans in the assembly had said weeks ago that he wanted to support cap and trade. He found a way to do that. It passed with a two thirds majority and more, you know, a little bit more than the two thirds majority that was necessary. And that means that the governor, uh, Ren, Assembly Member Rendon, the leader of the Democrats in the Assembly, uh, Kevin DeLeon, the leader of the Democrats in the Senate, Mary Nichols from the Air Resources Board, and Assembly Member uh, uh, Chat Mays from the uh, from the, the Republican Party are positioned to go abroad, if you will, to uh, audiences uh, uh, around the US and internationally and talk about a bipartisan 
outcome. Um, it that, that we passed quickly over the environmental justice issue, but really that was seminal a year ago and in coming into this negotiation to recognize that after 45 or 50 years, the uh, there's chronic there's communities that are chronically disadvantaged with respect to their environmental well-being, and the explicit uh, effort to ad address that helped build and strengthen the coalition, and and then finally. Um, the structure of the legislation itself. It's actually a familiar script in California to give strong uh, environmental goals and then charge the, what it, what's is arguably the most sophisticated technical agency in the world with respect to air pollution matters, give them the charge to find ways to, to achieve those goals. This legislation provides a bit more legislative oversight and guidance than we've seen previously, uh, but the agency, their resources board is uh, positioned to hold a public process, public hearings, to, to work out the details. Many In the presentation so far, you might have heard it with an ear towards, oh, this is left to be resolved, this is left to be, that is left to be resolved. And so things aren't really resolved yet, but it's actually just the opposite. This is the way everything has got, this is how we've made progress so far, is by a process that brings stakeholders together for hundreds of hours of stakeholder meetings, but ultimately their resources board deciding things like where the price levels are going to be, etc. So I really think this is an unremarked upon aspect of what was accomplished in California, the bipartisan nature and the pro way it has process. Um, in terms of the success of the, of the legislation also, if you were part of the California debate, you would realize that there has been quite a bit of discussion that, well, maybe they ought to crumple up the previous program and throw it away and replace it with something else. Instead, what we saw was an overwhelming support for the existing program through 2030. And that should be a strong signal to the compliance entities in California and potential linking partners abroad that C California now has a, a situation in place that is fundamentally immune to legal challenge. So it's strong going forward from a, from a um, pu public policy framework. Um, a word on cost containment that uh, Jim did an excellent job of describing. The Air Resources Board, in, to my reading, uh, and I think to their interpretation, still actually has the authority to potentially revisit an APCR and add it back in. That is additional price steps or adding additional allowances to those price steps that are borrowed from future years and put under there. That's how the APCR was populated in the uh, current program, none of those allowances were ever used. So they, therefore, they constitute the substantial reserve that is carried forward to the price steps in the next uh, program and potentially populating the price ceiling, the ultimate highest price ceiling. Uh, the, what I think what was innovative in the legislation is the explicit direction that rather than having a price ceiling that then would inevitably break the cap if it was ever triggered, they instead populated it with some, it's, it looks to me like it's intended to be populated with some APCR allowances. And then the Air Resources Board has is given direction to go outside the marketplace to find real validated um, emission reductions out of from out of market sources, for example, natural lands use and forestry, forestry et cetera. So it um, brings, uh, the, I mean, the cap trade program covers only 85% of the state's emission allowances anyway. There's 15% that are outside the market. And this creates an engine for potentially harvesting that. Um, my view is that the price is not going to go to the price ceiling, but you shouldn't listen to me because it really it's really important if I'm wrong. And some really smart economists like Jim Bushnell and Severin Bornstein and Frank Wallach think it is it is likely to go to the price ceiling. So, but let me just say why might it not? The APCR is one reason. The price the um the the second reason is the fact that there is banking that allows the continuation of privately held allowances from the current program into the future and allows for intertemporal rationalization of when investments are going to occur. And then thirdly, there is the Air Resources Board still playing a fundamental role in shaping California's climate future. So the Air Resources Board itself, uh, and uh, this was in Jim's slide, shows in the current program, the cap and trade program is really responsible for about 20% of the emission reductions that are achieved and something like 80% are ident in identified standards and measures that are being implemented currently. Um, so some people say, well, that means the cap and trade program isn't really doing much work, but the cap and trade program is ensuring that a cap is attained and that no low cost emission reductions get left behind. In the next decade, 
we see the, the, the draft scoping plan that Jim was referring to shows the role of cap and trade growing to be roughly 40% of the emission reductions, whereas standards and measures only identify about 60% of those reductions. So this, we should celebrate, is a huge victory for economic thought in the infusion of economic thought and the use of incentives in achieving strong climate out, outcome. Uh, there, we're going to be relying more and more on prices in the next period, and so prices uh, could uh, could end up being higher. I could be wrong, but I think that the fact that the Air Resources Board is still going to be in the game and finding additional ways to regulate the legislature is still going to be creative and finding additional programs that they're going to mandate. Th this is going to put uh, inevitably downward pressure on prices uh, to some degree. And, and then finally, about linking, I think the where the narrative was six weeks ago or eight weeks ago, there might have been some concerned that there was going to undermine the opportunity for linking. This program seems to me to do the opposite, to really put in place a solid framework that uh, other partners, other states in the U.S., other international partners, provinces in Canada, etc., can attach themselves to, uh, and it's really a solid foundation for linking going forward. So, Brian, those are the high-level overview comments I'd like to, to give on this. Thanks, Dallas. That was really terrific. Um, now, what I'd like to do is turn to Jan Masryk, and Jan directs the Climate Works Clean Power Program. Uh, she's worked on energy and climate policy issues at the federal and state level for more than 20 years, including uh, at the Nicholas Institute and before that uh, at RFF. So she's an old friend of uh, many of people who uh, have the camera on them. Uh, but notably, she worked as a senior policy advisor to ARB Chair Mary Nichols at the time. The original cap and trade rules were written earlier this decade. So, so my question for Jan is, how, does the, how do the changes that just passed sort of comport with your recall of the original ideas about how the carbon market was gonna work in California? What have we learned over the last five years? And uh, what challenges do you see that remain ahead? Jan? Thanks, Brian. And I, I know that my uh, esteemed colleagues have covered a lot of rich and fruitful terrain, and I wanna make sure we leave plenty of time for questions. So I, first of all, Brian, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, we can okay, hear you. <laughs> Great. So I just want to note that uh, although I'm currently with Climate Works, I'm going to be speaking in my former capacity as a senior policy advisor to uh, Chair Nichols. And also want to uh, give a nod to my colleagues at the Energy Foundation and uh, Environmental Innovations. They seeded this work ba back in 2001. And uh, I actually give a nod to them in my doctoral dissertation, which uh, unlike all, all of the economists on the call, I am a token political economist. And so I'm gonna come at this issue from that, from that frame. So, um, you know, speaking from my own experience, uh, I will say that, uh, what we've learned that the market works and it works very well. And to Dallas's point, and he alluded to this, what we also learned last night is that local interests can and should align with global interests. Um, and that is a, a, a very unique feat to pull off because as we know from economics, um, subnationals can bear the costs of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, but they can never fully capture the benefits which are dispersed globally. But it doesn't follow that there are no benefits to be had, and we've been seeing rich benefits here in California where uh, the economy continues to boom, and we have not seen uh, the levels of, of unemployment and costs that the models uh, that I and others were charged with developing and communicating in 2010 had predicted. So I want to paint a little bit of a picture of what it was like uh, starting around 2010 when Dallas and Jim, Brian, you, and my former colleagues at the Nicholas Institute were all thinking about these issues and uh, working with our colleagues in Sacramento. It was a very, very different time. Uh, we had just started to recover from a very, very dramatic set of economic circumstances that plagued not only California, but the US, Canada, and, and parts, parts of Europe and China. But what was happening when I was at ARB is that the capped entities were very concerned about the possibility of rolling blackouts. And as we learned back in 2001 with the unfortunate experience of electricity deregulation in California is that rolling blackouts and market speculation can pull a governor out of the horseshoe and uh, replace that governor with uh, someone who advocates for cap and trade. Um, there was also a very uh, serious worry about price spikes, which led to the genesis of the use of 
any number of cost containment instruments, including offsets, allowance price containment, reserve, banking, um, and the use of complementary measures. So uh, fast forward to today, um, I like to refer to this as the Goldilocks issue, and this is akin to the very rich and powerful work that Dallas uh, found around the experience of the SO2 problem program. Uh, there's always concern that uh, the porridge will be too hot. Um, and in, in, in practice, what happens is that it's, it's, it may be a little bit tepid uh, or typically just right. So the market has performed in California much better than I think all of the, the Debbie Downers and, and the Nervous Nellies had uh, fretted about, and I, this was very serious, Fred. I, I, when I left ARB, I actually worked with a number of capped entities here in California to run a series of, of experiments using behavioral economics and human subjects in a lab to see if they could crack the system and game it. And so I want to tip my hat to both RFF and former colleagues at UVA for that work. And even then, in a lab setting, we, we found that it was very, very difficult to break the system because it was so incredibly well designed. So um, yeah, the only thing that I would add is we, we haven't talked a lot about <laughs> Sorry, that was my Mac talking, but we, we haven't uh, talked a lot about um, some of the placeholder uh, initial legislation that was considered prior to last night's uh, successful vote. Um, it, was, it was quite elegant in theory, but it's terrain that Dallas and Jim and many, many others on the Economics Advisory Committee to the ARB had uh, covered in the past. And so I think my only... The only challenge that I can foresee, and my colleagues from Canada have alluded to this, is that while I applaud the extension of the cap to 2030, and it should certainly deliver us much more robust uh, auction proceeds, which will be welcome to uh, the communities that are disadvantaged and for which those auction proceeds are earmarked, uh, here at Climate Works, I worry very, very much about deep decarbonization and keeping temperatures from rising above our Paris commitments of two degrees Celsius. And so as I look forward to 2050 here in California, I think about having to completely decarbonize the electricity sector to electrify transport, to electrify end use applications in buildings and industry. And so although I certainly want to celebrate our work is far from over um, and what policies look like and what the attendant prices will look like as the level of ambition between 2030 and 2050 comes into into focus I think uh, is, is an issue to which unfortunately we're all going to have to turn sooner rather than later so I will stop there thanks yeah and that was that was great to, to give that perspective um, <clears throat> I want to mention one thing there um, and that's the Q&A option here so folks who want to ask questions should be sending uh, there's questions in the chat box to the to the attendee labeled Q&A. Please don't send them to me because I have a hard enough time walking and chewing gum at the same time, but reading and writing and translating is way beyond my capabilities. Um, but before we turn to the Q&A, because I think there have been some um, out there, I did I wanted to talk a little bit about the hard price ceiling, which from a sort of a you know carbon market design wonky perspective is is really you know, I wouldn't call it I wouldn't call it innovative per se because you know this has been part of the conversation for 20 years. It's like part of the cap and trade versus tax conversation, but it is a really important uh, breakthrough because it's really the the first uh, really hard price ceiling we've seen out there. And w w what I find it sort of interesting is when we talk about designing, we're all, we're often really designing for high prices, even though we've really everywhere cap and trade's been been worked, it's been a low price setting, but all programs are in their early stages, right? And so as you ratchet the cap down, it becomes tougher and becomes more expensive. So this makes sense. And I'm wondering, I'm going to start with you, Dallas, and anybody else can really chime in. So if you could sort of talk a little, you know, so one of the things about this program is that the revenues that would be raised by selling these price service, uh, price ceiling allowances will be used to buy reductions outside the cap. And you mentioned that. And and um, so I want to, you know, if you could give me your thoughts on, you know, if you can't buy allowances inside the cap for that price, because that's, you know, if we're operating at 60 or $70, it means that uh, that type of abatement's not available inside the cap. 
how are we going to go ahead and get abatement outside the cap that we think is going to be cheaper than what is prevailing in the market? So if you start and, and anybody else should just unmute themselves and sort of chime in when they feel like it. That's a really great question, Brian. And actually, I might have kicked it back to you and asked you, <laughs> since you have a strong expertise in offsets also. But I think the reasoning is that, uh, as Jim said at the outset, there's a concern by some that there was potentially too big a role for offsets in the program and that compliance entities could use offsets instead of achieving on-site emission reductions or emission reductions uh, of, among covered sources covered by the cap. That implies that there are uh, cost-effective emission, redu uh, emission reductions outside the market that are available. And what the legislation does is constrain the amount to get into the market down to 4% per, per compliance entity. Currently, it's at 8 And as Jim said also, that most many compliance entities don't use their max. So it, the group average tends to be less than the uh, than the individual average. Currently, the individual averages are at eight. You see something like 4%, I believe it is, actually realized now on a, on a uh, program-wide basis. Someone can correct me if that's important. But now it's going to be reduced to 4% and then go back up to 6% in 2025. So uh, that's suggests to me that many people think, and I think many of the offset providers think, that they have ample supply of low-cost emission reductions that are indeed available outside the market. There's still going to be a small role for that within the market as a compliance alternative at normal prices, if you will, but that role is now constrained to make sure, on behalf of the environmental justice interests and others, that there are real investments happening at covered facilities. But it appears to be that there is a pent-up supply of potential supply of out-of-market emission reductions from working lands uh, that could be harvested f at a cost that is somewhere approximate to the middle range of the between the price floor and the price ceiling now. So if there is a robust offset market that's already working, and then if, you know, there's there make, it seems like there could be a timing dilemma, A or B will be giving some thought to that. But if you see prices rise to those uh, cost containment reserve levels, and then potentially start to go up past that, I think ARB is going to kick into gear and start thinking about how it's going to provide incentives to bring additional out-of-market um, emission reductions uh, into the program. And that'll help actually, I mean, the, the, I think the, at least it may be not perfectly designed in everyone's mind, but the signal is clear that the legislature wants these reductions to be from under the cap. In other words, they're trying to defend the cap. They're not trying to, to say, well, at a certain price, there's a get, get out of jail free card or get out of jail for $60 card. It's actually, well, at that price, something else kicks in so that the state makes progress for achieving its overall uh, climate related goals. Oh, that's great, Dallas. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, the interesting challenge will be if, if they want to set up um, a, a uh, you know, if they want to have offsets available to put into the market, they're probably, they may have to pre-purchase them. And, and so if, if the price ceiling allowances haven't been sold, you know, what would be the revenue source for that? But that's all for ARB to work out. They're the ones who have the hard work in front of them right now. And in, in not just this, but in so many other kind of dimensions, including special reports about whether leakage is happening and whether or not they're going to need to consider a border, a border carbon adjustment, um, you know, whether or not they're successful uh, towards achieving cap, uh, the cap goals. And so, Jan, I just kind of wonder, you know, sort of hearkening back to your days there, and I know you're not speaking for Climate Works, and you're certainly not speaking for ARB, but really, a, a lot of the hard work really goes to them right now. And so, what does the road look like ahead for them? And then after that, Stuart, I think I'm going to turn to you uh, to help share some of the Q&As and direct them at some of our panelists. So, Jan, do you have any Anything to say about the hard work for ARB? <laughs> well, I can't think of a better uh, a better organization equipped to do the hard work. I mean, if we think back to the development of the original program, recall that Chair Nichols actually took an extra year between 2012 and 2013 because she wanted to make sure that they got the program absolutely right. And I know that they will exercise great care as well as great transparency. Any number of you, Brian included, were involved in the workshop processes that ARB follows with 30-day notice and comment and then extensive public participation around each and every design element of the program. And then one thing that I did neglect to add was during that very turbulent economic time as we were 
crawling out of the great financial crisis, you'll re recall uh, there, amid those concerns of price spikes and volatility, the offset limit originally was set at four. And mindful of the great uh, concern among the capped entities, as well as the broader economic interests in the state, Chair Nichols asked Governor Schwarzenegger uh, and suggested that it may be prudent to double that amount up to 8%. So uh, going back to four initially is where we first started. Um, and I think that given uh, the booming econ economy here in California, it can certainly withstand that. And so I have uh, great, great hope and expectations. The only thing that I would um, encourage the legislature to do is to make sure the ARB is well resourced to uh, address the task for it, and uh, given that we have elections coming up here, I, I, I hope that Chair Nichols is uh, taking lots of vitamins and, <laughs> and so that she, uh, hopefully the next governor will be prudent and keep her on board at the helm to uh, undertake these important tasks. Chair Nichols, if you're listening, please take your vitamins. Mm -hmm. um, Stuart, uh, could, you, could you help uh, convey any uh, questions that we have from the audience. And again, for, for those of you listening, please direct them to, to Q&A. Stuart? Sure. Um, yeah, we've got a bunch coming in now, so keep them coming and we'll, um, we'll go as long as we've got time. Uh, let me just start with a, a, a quick one, which is about competitiveness. Um, California has now had a system in place for about four years. Um, what, what evidence has there been about effects on competitiveness from the price? And I'll just add in from a, a Canadian context, we've done some research in Ontario, for example, in Quebec, showing about 2% of the industries here are what you'd call energy intensive trade exposed. And I think Dave Sawyer, your modeling that you put up for Ontario projected about a what, 0.03%, so a fraction of 1% impact overall GDP. Anyway, the question was about California, just because you've had now four years of experience, and I know there's concerns about what effect this will have on the economy. Uh, so I'll take that. Um, the I, I would say broadly, the effect has been minimal or imperceptible. Uh, the issue is that allowance prices have not been that high, and in combination, the I think we erred in the in the uh, direction of caution in terms of energy intensive trade exposed allocations. So I think there's fairly generous definitions of energy intensive and trade exposed and fairly generous um, output based allocations associated with those industries. So the combination of low allowance prices and very robust uh, energy intensive trade exposed uh, allocations has, has really made the competitiveness issue with regards to the allowance price uh, not very significant. Now there are you know sort of other issues associated with the cost of the complementary policies, electricity prices and, and other elements that are a more complicated story. But I think the allowance price channel has not been significant. Jim, this is Brian. I wanted to just kind of follow up on that and, and actually ask you, could you say a little bit about how the allowances targeted for trade exposed sectors uh, fares out in the new bill? And in my reading it of, it, of the other day, it was it's kind of buried down there. Um, and I know it's an important issue there. And I don't know if this is something that does get kicked to ARB or if it's specified clearly in the legislation. Yeah, I actually I'm not sure where things ended up in the final legislation. Um, my sense was that the current levels of allocation uh, were intended to be largely frozen at their levels rather than uh, the expectation that they might decline over years. Um, but I don't know, maybe one of the other panelists does, how much of that is left to ARB's discretion versus in the legislation. Okay, um, let me keep going. We've got a bunch of other questions here. Here's one for Dave coming from, looks like someone from one of the regulated entities in Ontario, um, asking you just to give a little more explanation about your price forecasts. Your chart had initially talked about projected price of around $20 a ton with the WCI link, and I believe that was a 2020 forecast. Then you had a slide talking about an $80 to $90 per ton allowance. Um, and maybe explain a little bit more what you mean about what you think the, the projected trajectory will be. 
Is it unmuting? There it is. Sorry, I wasn't unmuting. Sorry about that. Um, I like to say I do Harry Potter economics where I wave my magic wand and expecto decarbonus and we get a forecast. Um, so we don't know GDP next quarter. So we're talking 2030. So that's the caveat. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the $20 and the $157 was, were, were 2020. Um, so that's sort of, you know, what's going to happen in 2020. The, the 80 to $90 is the uh, 2030 estimate. Um, and so that estimate, I mean, it's up in the air, but, you know, some of the work that's gone on looking at the speed bumps, looking, as was mentioned earlier, uh, uh, about the probability of being at the floor and the ceiling. Um, and then also looking at where the social cost of carbon sits uh, and, and, you know, sort of saying, okay, what, what's going on here? Um, and so you sort of get to this, and, and, and Dallas had mentioned the $60 US price. So 60 to 70 US dollars with exchange rate puts us into 80 to 90 bucks. So that's sort of where I think we're sitting right now. It'll be subject to change and it's pure conjecture, but yeah, that's sort of the logic on it. A weighted tier you know, price building up from tier one, tier two, and then the price ceiling. Yeah, I'll stop. When you say right now, um, what do you mean? I mean, 2020 to 2030 is a long time. Is that sort of in the middle range of that? So obviously that's not gonna be January 1st, 2020, right? Yeah, that's 20, yeah, 2030 estimates. I mean, so, I mean, we can expect some, we already saw a little up, upward pressure in the markets already, right? Pennies and sort of, you know, the business community is much more bullish. You hear that this morning. So we're going to see the upward pressure in the short term. I mean, the big open question is when the market goes from long to short and, and when does that price start moving away from the floor uh, and up? So there is a bunch of patterns, you know, between sort of early 2020s and 2030. Uh, but again, that's all pure conjecture. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just add the, the one of the big uh, things that we've all grappled with is the extent to which a future expectation of a higher price feeds back into current prices. Uh, and one of the mysteries of the current market has been that the, the increase of the price floor is locked in, basically guaranteeing a 5% real return for people who could buy allowances at the current floor. And yet there's been no arbitrage of that. Uh, implying that people have uh, either a higher cost of capital than that or that there's still reluctance to buy in advance in anticipation of, of almost guaranteed higher prices in the future. So how that would feed back to a higher price is, is one of the things that, that we're all interested in seeing how that plays out. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got a, a really good question. Well, they're all good questions, but a, a sort of a politically interesting question from a, a prominent newspaper reporter here in Canada who says, um, what are the challenges to Canada, including imported allowances from California in its NDC accounting? Does it need the Trump administration cooperation? Which I think means, you know, Ontario and Quebec may say they will count California reductions towards their provincial targets, but in terms of Canada's national target under Paris, will we be able to count those without the, the agreement from the Trump administration to allow those reductions to be transferred. Uh, anyone want to take a stab at that one? Bunch of cowards. Well, let me let me start. I'm not, saying, too, I'm not too cowardly to admit that I really have no idea. That's an that is an excellent question. And I think it gets to the, the notion that the, you know, the Paris Accord itself wasn't legally binding in the sense that if you didn't meet the, the target you specified in your INDC that you'd be held accountable. Uh, but the general notion is they were gonna be developing uh, internationally transferable mitigation options between countries that would have some rules. And I frankly have not kept up with that in the last few months to know what the status of those rules are. I can say that from the little bit that I know, one of the, where it real, what really boils down to in Canada, I think, is that Ontario and Quebec, for the purposes of meeting their targets, say, look, these are real reductions and we can count them. But the interesting question will be, Canada has set a national baseline um, that all provinces must meet to qualify for equivalency. And will Ontario and Quebec be able to count California reductions to show they've met the national minimum standard if the U.S. won't let those, those, those reductions be transferred at a nation-to-nation -nation level. So you almost got two different levels, right? You've got the state-to-province level, which is less problematic, but unless they work out the nation-to-nation, -nation, 
there's going to be a real issue about whether Ontario and Quebec will meet equivalency here. And as far as I know, that's not yet worked out. But it's one of the issues to be worked out under the Paris Accord, and we've got a bit of time to solve it. Um, but my, I'm not aware that there's a, there's a solution to it yet. But I also think that it's one of the issues folks are working on. Anyone else know more than that? Okay, good question, Sean. Um, there is um, a couple of questions about basically, do Ontario and Quebec have to accept the architecture of California's programs? So if we link, does that mean, for example, we have to adopt the same limit on offsets? Um, do we have to accept the market structure like the speed bumps or the higher price caps? You know, how much difference can there be and still be linkage? I think Dallas may want to weigh on this, but my understanding is, is that the price ceiling um, is the most important both, I think, in terms of real impact and in terms of uh, the uh, legal aspects of linkage, that there is some flexibility with regards to both the price floor and uh, certainly with offsets, uh, where each jurisdiction has uh, more discretion to do what it prefers in those dimensions. Um, speed bumps is a new terrain, but I expect that that is also something that does not necessarily have to be uh, unified across the three markets, but there's a real uh, incentive issue in terms of if, if California is offering uh, allowances at a certain price level that aren't being offered by the other jurisdictions, they're either selling before or after the other jurisdictions. So there is some equity issues about that, but I don't think it's a um, rigid requirement of the, of the linkage. So they wouldn't have to accept the ceiling. I know they currently share the floor price. So that, that's uh, the no, no, they, I, I believe they do have to coordinate on the ceiling. They okay. do also coordinate on the floor price. They're not required to, but it just kind of makes sense. To have the highest floor price just means you're selling after everybody else. Right. Um, and so there's a, you know, just a natural incentive to try to coordinate on that. Thanks. Anyone else want to weigh in? Okay. Um, Brian, oh, Dave, jump in. Yep. Dave, unmute. There we go. Hey, I'm muted. Yeah. So there really quickly, there are four areas where each uh, jurisdiction WCI participant can make their own decisions, right? So it's their overall target. Um, it's the how the proceeds are used, um, how they allocate the emissions and then offsets. Mm -hmm. Those are the four sort of major areas and then coordination on the market rules. I mean, that's the benefit, right? Outsourcing to the WCI. Some of those really detailed rules sort of helps everybody. So yeah, that was just a quick, quick overview of what you know, what each jurisdiction has really to do. Okay. Um, we've had a, a bunch of different U.S. questions, all focusing on kind of the equity impacts, um, what, what impact this new legislation will have on low-income communities, um, urban versus rural impacts. Um, so just as a general question, how will this new legislation in California, presumably, uh, affect low-income communities? Will it have a disproportional effect on rural communities? I'm happy to take that one. Uh, yeah, you know, California, uh, so there is a requirement that is enshrined in regulation that the that the allowance proceeds primarily be directed into disadvantaged communities. And so that, that's always been there, that will stand. And now there is the additional uh, safeguard in the companion legislation, which we haven't been discussing around uh, the, the point source regulation. Um, that being said, pollution in California, as we all know, comes from a stew of sources. Uh, there are particulates that are kicked up just through atmospheric conditions and um, you know, sunlight is also a cause in our basins such as LA and the San Joaquin Valley. And I don't want to understate uh, the severity of, of air pollution, particularly in the San Joaquin Valley. That being said, uh, why, what was very noteworthy, I think, and uh, over the course of the last several days is the degree to which the agricultural community has come on board and there are provisions that will help to uh, 
with the transition of heavy polluting equipment in the form of forklifts and, and all of the off-road vehicles that uh, we use in our great Central Valley to produce food. And so that coupled with the potential for creating new categories of offsets in California, it's very, very tough to find those areas because so much is already regulated here in state. But uh, as, we sit or, as we sit here and look at what has to happen globally starting in 2030, we see the very, very important role of land-based sources and the potential for not only mitigation, but also removal, um, turning carbon, taking carbon out of the atmosphere and holding it for some time. And I know that my former colleagues at ARB have been thinking very, very hard about some of these questions and what they potentially offer in the form of benefits for California's sizable agricultural community. So I agree with all that. And it, it's, it's also important to recognize that what passed yesterday was a means for complying with a bill that passed a year ago. So when we talk about impacts to any community, um, we have to think about the advantages of uh, cap and trade and other market-based compliance mechanisms relative to the alternatives for achieving a, a goal that's already on the books. So uh, there was a lot of discussion about how uh, the bill last night would do this or that to energy prices, but that has to be taken in the context of relative to what the challenges would look like without cap and trade which uh, I think a lot of people agree would be uh, much more substantial and could have much uh, worse impacts for a lot of these communities um, if we did not have this tool, not only for mitig mitigating compliance costs, but also for um, generating revenues that could be used to help ease that transition. Okay, thanks for that answer. And I know, uh, just to add the Ontario context briefly, one of the things that is interesting to note is that Ontario actually, um, before bringing in this cap and trade, phased out coal power over a seven year period from 2005 to 12. So even before this cap was set, they brought down GHGs by over 20% over the previous seven years, which was also the largest source of air pollution uh, for all communities, wealthy and poor. So the, the two are very much linked. Ontario kind of led with, with coal for air pollution reasons, but the GHG reductions obviously followed that. So the two issues are, are very much linked on both sides of the border. Um, this is a question which I think was largely answered through Brian's initial question. Let me just clarify it. There was someone from one of the provincial regulatory agencies here in Canada has said, with the hard price ceiling in California, does that mean that it's possible that there will be additional allowances or additional emissions uh, permitted beyond the budgeted emissions cap? I think I know the answer, but just why don't I ask one of you just to clarify that. Will this hard price ceiling in the end allow additional reductions beyond the cap, which was the case with a similar system in Alberta we had here in Canada? Uh, I'm not sure, allow additional reductions beyond the cap? Is Sorry, that... additional emissions. Oh, the... okay. I mean, so technically the idea is there would be more allowances sold um, at the price ceiling. I mean, that is actually the case right now. It's just the number of allowances that would be sold is, is limited by the finite size of the APCR. Um, as the early discussion got into, the, the issue then becomes, what do you do with the revenues generated from these additional allowance sales to the extent they could be used in ways that, um, that reduce em uh, emissions from either cap sectors or uncapped sectors you could get more or less emissions. Um, and certainly one of the discussions that's gone around is you could use them to buy allowances from other cap and trade markets, like in Europe. If those prices are quite a bit lower than our price containment price, then you're actually reducing carbon at a multiple of what, um, of what it would be if you were applying them in California or in uh, the rest of the WCI. Uh, so technically in a narrow sense, you're selling more allowances, but what the net impact on uh, emissions would end up being depends on how effective and where the, that revenue is directed. Okay. Um, great, thanks. Um, it's a question um, from a professor in, in Quebec saying, um, there's estimations that Ontario and Quebec are about 15 to 20 million tons short of their 2020 objective. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, and Will the, the kind of existing banked allowances through 2020 uh, be enough to, to accommodate that? 
more about the relationship between Ontario and Quebec having a, a shortage to make up and the existence of banked allowances and how those two might interact. Any thoughts on that? Sure, maybe you could clar clarify or maybe speculate whether the questioner is asking about the bank allowances in California and whether they could be used to help make up the shortfall in Quebec and Ontario. Is that your sense of what's being asked? Yeah, is, is there enough banked allowances to contain WCI price in 2020 is the exact wording. Well, maybe, maybe Dave has some thoughts on that. Dave, unmute. Dave? Dave, you're on mute. I'm, I, the host keeps muting and unmuting me, so I'm, I'm clicking it five, four or five times. Yeah, so the shortfall looks to be fairly significant, right? 15 to 20 and change megatons would be off, I think. So then the question is, is there enough surplus? Is the California market long enough to, to um, make up that shortfall as a backstop? But of course, we have an offset system that's being developed in Ontario and Quebec, a joint offset system, where they have different it, protocols are under, uh, under development right now. And those are going to be pan-Canadian, meaning you can source anywhere in Canada. So it could open up a whole series of domestic offsets um, to address that shortfall. And then the success of the complementary regulations, of which there are many, and the, and the sort of two plus billion a year in, in spending that's going to go on to sort of accelerate uh, tech deployment. Uh, in Ontario and Quebec. So, so yeah, it's, an, it's, you know, do you need that much from California? Probably not, but is it a backstop and is there enough there? Well, it looks like the market's long enough that if, you know, Quebec and Ontario emitters, regulated entities need them, they can wade, wade into the market. Um, and certainly we're seeing, you know, fully subscribed auction market in Ontario um, showing that, you know, it's a bit of a durable policy to start and it, the compliance behavior of the big entities is to treat it like a, you know, a quarterly obligation and wait into the market. So we, you know, we see demand probably continuing for, for some time. So yeah, I'll stop there. One last quick question. We're almost at the time stop and I'll throw it out to all of you, a bit of a crystal ball question. Um, do you foresee other jurisdictions joining into this system? I know that's been discussed over, and that's certainly been California's objective and Ontario and Quebec. So crystal ball question. Um, do you see other jurisdictions joining into this system? And feel free to speculate as who that might be. Well, the, the Oregon seems to be one that's uh, fairly far along in a process. They're considering legislation um, this year that, that's really sort of geared towards um, a decision on whether to join next year. Uh, and that's one of the arguments that, that many of us have been making about why we wanted to pass a bill this year so that other entities that wanted to join. So Oregon is the most likely. Washington State actually has a trading system right now, a strange cap and reduce system. Um, there's a, a lot of interesting um, thought going on about how that could be made somewhat compatible uh, with our system. Um, I'd like to hear whether there's any other uh, possible Canadian uh, membership. Anyone, Dave? Me. There it is. I'm muted by the host. Yeah, so it's interesting, right? I mean, it's sort of like policy Darwinism that you, you know, the, the cap and trade programs or hybrid programs that might be baseline and credit with trading provisions. Um, they're being a design, they're being designed with an eye on, on linkage. Um, certainly for the industrial sectors and output based allocations, we have a nice sort of national you know, consistency starting a line around OBAs. Um, so they'll make linking easier later. So it's not to say anybody's going to jump in right away to join WCI as a full market participant, but absolutely those, you know, the outsourcing of rules and looking forward on design elements um, is driving policy in a whole number of jurisdictions, which of course is being catalyzed by the federal um, willingness to push their own policy should, should some provinces not move. Um, so yeah, we're we're all outsourcing out of California somewhat. I'll I'll just add, of the ones in Canada, Manitoba has, has said it's looking. It's been a partner in WCI for much of its history, so the possibility of them. 
What about, just to throw out bigger questions, what about Mexico or linking with Europe or bringing some of the Northeast Reggie states in? There seem to be a lot of governors in the U.S. saying that they're prepared to take more bold action in, the, in, in light of federal slowing down. Uh, any of those things likely to happen? Well, uh, uh, in the U.S., an individual state couldn't strike a deal with an entire sovereign country, but they could strike a deal with subnational entities. And there have been discussions over time uh, with uh, California and states within Mexico and extending to some potential f uh, reduced forestation offsets uh, beyond Mexico to include Brazil and other parts of the world. So, but, uh, but couldn't, couldn't strike a deal with a, with a sovereign, uh, sovereign national. The only thing I would add within, you know, what, what, what would seem like an obvious candidate, but maybe isn't so obvious, and, and, and Dallas could weigh in because he and I have both done some work with the Reggie program, would be the Reggie program. But before you would do that, first of all, Reggie states would have to agree to go beyond just the power sector. Uh, and there's been some discussions at, this, at the state level of that they might go beyond that. They've talked about geographic expansion, they've talked about sectoral expansion. But that would seem to be uh, necessary in order to be any kind of equivalent level of stringency across those programs so that we might expect to see the same prices. And I, I don't know if Dallas wants to weigh in on that, um, but I will shut my mic up. Well, at the invitation, Brian, I'll just say that uh, the challenge is different levels of stringency and the Northeast states, Reggie, are subject to a great deal of uh, electricity transmission within the same power market. And it's more difficult, some argue more difficult to track than has been true in California. However, I, one, I, take, a I take a different point of departure from one thing you said. It's conceivable, uh, and I've heard it discussed more than once uh, with state officials, that a di different sector might look to join the WCI from, say, some of the Northeast states or other states. It, the WCI model is an economy-wide model, but folks at their resources board have told me that they're certainly open to receiving phone calls about the, uh, at the, of the suggestion that some state might engage in a linked system that wasn't economy-wide, but as long as it didn't have obvious leakage possibilities. So bringing in, for example, the transportation sector in another state and linking it to the WSI, in particular in order to identify a source of revenue that might be useful for infrastructure or other program development is something that could be considered. Thanks, there you go. Any sectors out there, get on the phone now, link. Um, we're past the anointed witching hour and um, the questions are starting to slow down and I think people probably have other things to, to move on to. So thank, thank you all very much. This has been, uh, I can tell you from behind the scenes, there was a lot of fretting on our part of what would happen if California didn't vote the way they did last night and, and what this webinar would look like. And so it, um, thank them again for giving us the simplicity we hope for. And thank each of you. This was a remarkable group of experts on both sides of the border to talk about a remarkable policy experiment on both sides of the border. And this is really the beginning of the discussion. And uh, maybe we'll reconvene again at some point and see how these systems are working. Brian, everyone, thanks very much.